Well, what's going on, everybody? Who's excited to be in church today? Is there anybody? Let's go! Best response you've had yet this fall, so way to be. Hey, I'm so glad we get to be together today. We are starting a brand new four-part series called Stories of the Kingdom. More on that in just a minute, like we do every single week. I want to say hello to our church online family. We're so glad that we have technology that helps us be connected every single week like this. There's nothing like being in the room, but this technology is an amazing thing to close the gap that distance creates. So maybe you're uh, on vacation, you're getting some of those last cabin weekends in, maybe you're out of town this week, or you're catching up later online. We're so glad that you're along for the ride with us here. We love you so much. We hope we get to see you you very soon. But hey, I want to do a couple things. One of the things I love to do every time I uh, get to step into the pulpit and do what I get to do. I love it so much. This is my favorite time during the week when we go to God's Word together. Uh, But I love to celebrate people and give honor away. And I want to honor two people today uh, really quick. Number one, Pastor Miranda is coming up on her She's going to be starting year seven of her ministry here. And so we are gifting Pastor Miranda with a ministry sabbatical. It's going to look a little different. Pastor Miranda is a bivocational minister, which means not only she works for the church, but she also has another full-time job. Uh, so it's going to look different than like the sabbatical that Pastor, Be- or Pastor Beth just declared a whole new thing right there uh, that I took with my wife, with my family. Um, so we're going to split this up into two six weeks times away for Pastor Miranda. Parents, you're going to hear more about this. More details are coming. Uh, but we're gifting Pastor Miranda two six-week sabbaticals, one that's going to start uh, midway through January and go all the way through the month of February. Why mid-January? Because she's going to help get her team ready and get ministry rolling and, uh, as we come back after the holidays. Why mid-May through June? Because she will not miss summer camps. And so she's going to be back in July. And, uh, well, she won't be back back, but she's going to get the opportunity to travel. We talked about doing like January, February, and March. And she, in all of her wisdom, said, the weather's going to stink. I don't want to get to do some travel while the weather's bad. 100% agree. Can we do one thing? Can we just say thank you to Pastor Miranda? She's an amazing person. We love her so much. All of our staff are amazing, but we love to be in a position as a church, and it's a testament to her leadership and ministry that our team is going to thrive and ministry is going to continue while Pastor Miranda is away for a few weeks for her sabbatical. That's one. Number two, I announced this this past Wednesday at First Wednesday. But if you would, mark your calendars for the first Wednesday service happening on November 2nd. Our predecessors, our pastor, my family's pastor, Pastor Pete and Diane Drake will be returning to Real Life Church. And we love them so much. We're excited that we get to have them back speaking life. Uh, Pastor Pete and I, we've just been having conversations as what does it mean for a church to be led by the Spirit, and so I think it's going to be an amazing time. Um, Pastor Pete and Diane pastored real life from January of 1997 through April of 2017, so nearly a 20-year run. It was a little over 19 years, so they are generational pastors for our church. If you haven't met them yet, don't miss that night. It's going to be an amazing time. You're going to fall in love with a couple that Beth and I love so dearly. So we're excited for that. If you are new with us here at Real Life, we want to say that we're so glad that you're with us. I think you're coming in at a great time here in the fall and lots of exciting things are happening. But I want to tell you, here's how we're going to wrap up our time together today. Every week, we take the last five minutes of our time together just to connect with the people that are sitting around us. That's why I had you high five and meet some people is because I don't want this to be a weird thing. But at the end, we're just going to talk about our time in God's words today. So I want you to be listening to the message today. I want you to be listening to scripture with these questions in mind. What is God saying to you today? Or maybe what's one thing that you've learned today as we go through our time together in the message? And that's one thing, one next step that you can take to walk out what God is showing you. And the most important thing that we can do together as a church family is we can pray together. So number three, how can we pray for you 
today. That's how we're going to wrap up our time. You ready to go to God's word this morning? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much. We're so thankful for the life and the health, the vitality, the spiritual depth that you're just pouring into our church family. We're experiencing some renewal, and it's an amazing thing. It's all centered around you. It's not about what we're doing. It's about what you're doing. And so these moments, as we go to your word, it's an opportunity for you to speak over us. And so, Holy Spirit, how we would say this is we, we invite you. It sounds an audacious thing, but we invite you into this moment. Be moving and speaking to us, moving in our minds and in our hearts, moving through us as we interact with each other. Lord, we're here to encounter you. So would you meet with us as we go to your word? And we pray this in your name. And everyone said amen. 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 I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine, an out-of-state friend of mine, and he was asking me the question, are you ready for winter? And so after I slapped him and apologized, um, well, you know, we had frost this week, right? Like it, it's right around the corner and we know it. But he was asking questions like, how can you stand it? Like I've got, you know, a sister that lives out in LA. When are you moving out? You know, and like my browser history has more and more Zillow things as I'm looking at houses. We're not moving. Um, we... But you know, as Minnesotans, let's just be real. We're kind of proud of our winters. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're proud that we make it through, like we tough it out. Um, at least I do. But I, there's one thing I can't abide. Do you want to know what I can't abide about winter? Those frozen ruts on the road. You know what I'm talking about? Some, some, some of you live in communities where they plow your roads really, really well. Like they get it right to the pavement. And, and some of us, because this is my neighborhood, live in areas where, um, well, I, I like to speak life, but I'm just going to say, well, maybe not so much. And people drive through it, and what happens? You get those frozen ruts in the middle of the road, and, and usually they're right down the middle, right? And then you've got that moment where you're coming up, and you're in a rut, and so is the car that's coming your way. They're in the same rust. And what happens? That steering wheel, like it fights to stay inside of that rut. It's, it's almost like every winter we're driving on an old kid's slot car track. Who remembers those amazing slot car tracks? Like greatest thing ever. Uh, by the way, if you're an Amazon subscriber, you got your kid's toy catalog in the mail this week. Amazing. I didn't see a slot car track. I want a slot car track. Listen, we got a number of responses on our annual Easter survey. Parenting, that's why we just did a parenting series. Parenting was number one. The number two response that we got on our Easter survey was, how do I get out of a spiritual rut? That's a really interesting question, isn't it? How do I get out of a spiritual rut? I think I know what you mean by that. Sometimes it feels like our spiritual life is like that slot car track. Or it's like those frozen winter roads that no matter what we do, it just we're, we're stuck and we try to turn out of it, but we're just locked into these ruts. We feel stuck. We try to find our own way out, but it only seems like we get deeper and deeper into the grooves of that spiritual rut. So I want to take the next four weeks, I want to talk about that. I want to give you four different kind of ideas, four different things that you can do to add some spiritual life and vitality to your walk with Jesus to help you get out of a spiritual rut. I want to start with an interesting verse. The entire ministry of Jesus can be summed up in just one verse. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus said this. This was said of Jesus and then his quote. From then on, after Jesus' public ministry began to start, began, he said this, he began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Why that verse? Why that sentence? Everything about Jesus' ministry centered around that singular idea, turn back to God. Jesus came to die for the world's sin, to be the, the once and final sacrifice for all mankind. But he was preparing his people, he was preparing us to carry on that ministry. Life carries on. The ministry of Jesus carries on through us. We've been given a mission to reach the world for Jesus and make disciples in his name, calling the church, calling the world to do two things. 
to repent of sins and turn back to God, to live according to his ways. But here's how we're going to do this over these four weeks. I want to look at four parables. I want to talk about parables of Jesus. There's something about these stories from Jesus. Why were they so powerful for people then? And why do they continue to be powerful now? Well, they're practical, everyday stories that Jesus used to explain deep, meaningful kingdom principles. We don't know everything that Jesus preached in three years of his ministry. What we get in the Gospels are the the most important things. The Holy Spirit breathes stories passed down through the generations. But we don't know everything Jesus preached about his ministry. But I think Matthew gives us a really good clue. From then on, he preached two things. Repent of your sins and turn back to God. And I'm convinced that the parables were actually connected to that teaching. Parables connect real life to Jesus' kingdom in a really tangible way. Maybe put it this way to help you track a little bit with what I'm thinking. Parables were the sermon illustrations that Jesus used to connect the reality of everyday life to what it meant to turn back to God. Both for his people, people that identified and were following him, and for people that were far from Jesus. They're the handles that help us grasp what it means to be God's people. So over the next four weeks, here's what you can expect. I want to look at parables of Jesus that will give us tangible ways to get our spiritual lives out of those ruts. I want to look, I think Jesus is going to speak life over us and get us out of those ruts. They're intentional choices. These parables, if we walk out these parables, they're intentional choices that we can make to experience a personal renewal in our relationship with Jesus. And that is so important. Getting out of a rut is experiencing a personal renewal with Jesus. I get so grieved. Like as your pastor, I get so grieved when I hear that any of our church family, that they're stuck in their spiritual lives. But there's a fantastic parable that we can go to as a starting place to get good, healthy spiritual rhythms back in life. My message today is titled, A Story About Dirt. Isn't that great? I love it. A story about dirt. And we're going to read Matthew chapter 13. And this is going to take take a while. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23. Let me just start reading here in Matthew 13. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got on a boat. Then he sat there and taught as many and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. Okay, let's just stop there for a minute. First, number one, I love that Jesus is the creator of the universe, demonstrates his knowledge of acoustics to allow everyone to hear him. Sound travels better over water. I just love that detail in the story. I I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Okay, that's done. Second, catch the detail. He taught and he told stories. He taught and he told stories. What did he teach? Repent. Turn from your sins and turn back to God. And he taught using these parables to explain what that means. Why? Because we connect with stories. Do you want to know how I can best get your attention other than my, like, my clapping thing? Is when I say this. Hey, let me, t- let me tell you a story. And everyone just zooms right in. Let me tell you a story. We connect with story. Why? Because life his story. So Jesus is speaking these parables. He's using these parables to teach kingdom principles in really tangible ways. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. And as he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Verse 7, other seeds fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much has been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Luke chapter 8 actually records this same parable. There's a lot here 
to unpack. Jesus is on the water with a crowd that's gathered around him to hear him teach. Actually, Luke gives us an additional detail and said they've gathered from many towns all around the area to come and hear him teach. They'd heard of Jesus. They'd heard of his miracles. Maybe they'd even seen him perform miracles. He's gaining a reputation as someone you want to go and hear. People from all over Judea and all over Galilee are becoming his followers. So here he is on the water teaching about the kingdom of God, and he starts with a story about seeds and soil. Rather than asking what the meaning of the story is, look what the disciples ask him. The disciples came and asked him in verse 10, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Verse 11, Jesus replied, you're permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom, but others aren't. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given And they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use parables. They look, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. You've seen that moment as you're having conversations with someone, right? That moment where you know they're hearing, but they're not really listening. Parents, all the time, you see that glazed over look. (laughs) Listen, Jesus understood. Jesus understood that the hearts of some were hardened toward him. A whole generation of people missed that he was the Messiah. They were actually the ones that should have been the, the ones to usher in the kingdom of heaven. The parable is a warning. Don't let your heart harden toward God. It's part of the ongoing story of being the people of God. What's the story? People would fall away from God. They'd turn their hearts back. Turn the page, especially when you're in the Old Testament and in the history. They'd turn to God. They'd fall away. They'd turn to God. They'd fall away. Jesus is saying if they were really paying attention, if they were actually listening, this parable, this story would help them understand. They would have caught this pattern. It's from their own history. It's their story. And for so many of us, it's our story. Jesus isn't hiding the kingdom of God or making it a mystery. He's actually unveiling it and demonstrating it. To us. Look at Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. God is speaking through the prophet Hosea. I said, I plant the seed, good seeds of righteousness, and you harvest a crop of love. Isn't that interesting? Plant the good seeds of righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of love. Look at that. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Jesus is reaching back into their story with a tangible handle for this truth. He's teaching a kingdom principle right from their own story. If you want to hear from God, if you want uh, to, your roots to grow down deep, that's been a verse we've been sharing out of Colossians a lot lately. If you want your roots to grow down deep, you have to get out of a spiritual rut. He's using a, a farming metaphor, familiar for them, somewhat familiar to us. He's telling a story. Hey, you can experience a deep abiding abundance in me, but there's a responsibility on you. You have to do your part. You have to prepare your heart so the seed has a healthy place to grow. Maybe say it a different way. You need to cultivate your heart in order to experience lasting spiritual growth. You need to cultivate your heart, the soil of your heart, in order to experience lasting spiritual growth. It's not up to others. It's not up to me to do this for you. The only person that can do the work of preparing your hearts is you. Jesus is warning his people. You'll miss me. You will miss my kingdom if you don't do the work. Grace is free. Don't ever get me wrong on this. Grace is free. Forgiveness is free. It's done, signed, sealed, and delivered 
by Jesus. Grace by faith. Forgiveness of sins is through grace by faith. And that's it. But spiritual work is a discipline. Spiritual growth is a discipline. It's work. You have to do the work of cultivating your heart. And if we don't do the work of preparing our hearts, nothing is going to grow. The Jesus way isn't going to take. And look how Jesus tells his people what this means. Matthew doesn't record this, this particular detail, but Luke records Jesus explaining the parable to people. And he says this in verse 11 of Luke 8. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. Let's just get it out there and define the terms of the story. The seed is in life. It is in circumstances. It is in money. It's not your spouse or your kids. The seed is God's word. End of Satan. Which means Jesus is the farmer. God's word is the seed and Jesus is the farmer. He's spreading his word, calling everyone to be his people. And Jesus is giving a real world, tangible, practical example of the kind of hearts that his word finds. What's he saying to us? It's up to you to determine the kind of soil that your heart is. Well, what kind of hearts do we find? There's actually four in here. The first one is a tainted heart. God's word can find a tainted heart. Verse 19 in Matthew 13. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one, Luke actually says, then Satan comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. We know that there are people in the world who just will flatly reject Jesus. No. Their hearts are hardened to Jesus. Their hearts are hardened to Christ's followers and the good news of Jesus. But let's look at that verse in just a little bit different angle and think about us. What happens when we allow our hearts to get hardened? When we allow something to creep into our lives that hardens our hearts, our spirits to Jesus. Maybe it's a sin issue. Maybe it's an unresolved hurt. Maybe something that was spoken over us. Something evil gets in and taints our hearts toward God. It corrupts our hearts. Maybe it's been inflicted on us or maybe we've allowed it to happen. Maybe we've had no control over what's happened, but it's happened. We don't really understand freedom and grace when we're living in a hard heart place, and that word falls on deaf ears. It's a warning that the seed of God's word can't grow on hard soil. So a tainted heart. You tracking with me? Look at this one. How about a distracted heart? Verse 20, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. This is good news. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. What happens? Well, they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. I thought life was supposed to get easier when we followed Jesus. Have you ever had your yard replaced with brand new sod? Anybody? Like completely taken away and all new sod? There's nothing more satisfying than perfectly manicured new grass. It's awesome. But the soil that comes with that sod is like this thick. Like you see it drying out immediately after it gets cut by the sod cutter. It's not deep enough to sustain health and growth. What happens? You've got to work those roots into the soil. You've got to break up that dirt. You've got to start applying nutrients right away. Those roots have to grow down into soil in order for that grass to take. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Shallow soil, which is really hard to say when you're A, have a lisp, and B, are missing a tooth. I'll just say it. Shallow soil. It takes intentional thought. Someone hears the good news of Jesus. This is exciting. My life is going to change. I can't believe what Jesus has done for me. But as soon as something bad happens, because those roots haven't gotten down deep, they haven't sustained their growth, as soon as there's a challenge, they wither. They stop growing. There wasn't enough there. Life distracts. It pulls attention away. 
because they haven't done the work of growing down deep roots. If there isn't any work to grow those roots down deep, there's no foundation for sustained health. This person loves God. The good news is good news, but they get distracted. God isn't on their mind and on their hearts. They're not doing the work of preparing the soil that's all about refocusing life on God. They're distracted. So we need to refocus. We need to do the work. If this is you, if life is distracting, if you don't feel like you've gotten grown down deep, re-engage with those words. Like someone, someone might hear the words, you have to re-engage with spiritual disciplines and go, oh, spiritual disciplines is where life and health happens after salvation. Good, healthy, spiritual rhythm. So a tainted heart, a distracted heart. Number three, just call it what it is, an immature heart. There's an immaturity. Verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represent those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. It isn't wrong to be immature in the Lord. Everyone starts off as a baby Christian. That's okay. That's what happens. The trap is getting stuck and staying there, never growing. Paul has an admonition. You have to get off the milk and have some meat. Have to do the work of cultivating our hearts, doing the work to provide a stable atmosphere for growth. The warning from Jesus is if we stay immature, if we don't do the work of growing in health and freedom, if we don't deal with issues from our past and move forward with our faith, everything else in life will cut off all the growth of good health. It'll get crowded out. I like that phrase. Life in Jesus winds up competing for other resources in life instead of feeding it with time with energy, with relationships, good, healthy rhythms, we let it go. The cares of, and worries of life choke out the growth. We stop growing. There's a stagnancy that happens in our spiritual lives. This person is stuck in a spiritual rut and they never grow. Maybe this is you. You've, you've felt something like this before. Here we are again. We're in that same spot. I'm dealing with this same issue. Here we are again. Six months later, I know what's coming. It's right around the corner. Dealing with the same issue over and over again. The only cure for that is to do the work and prepare for growth. You have to put yourself in a posture to grow. You have to be engaged. Spiritual disciplines are healthy. Prayer, worship, relationship, community. They're so key. So here's the plug. <laughs> Just call it what it is. I've said this before. You've heard me say this before. If you go all in with the spiritual disciplines for a year, your life will never be the same. If you go all in and do community and do life with a life group, you have people around you who are growing and praying and you're growing and praying for them, your life will never be the same. If you go all in and join a life team and you serve others and you make a difference, your life will never be the same. If you go all in and you pray every single day, you will never be the same. Why? Because you're doing the work of cultivating a good heart. If you worship Jesus every single day, if you start off every single day being connected to his word and worshiping and praying for others, praying for people who are far from God, praying for your enemies, blessing those who persecute you, your life will never be the same. Why? Because you've added to the good soil of your heart. If you go all in and do the work to make your heart ready, you will grow. Well, Jim, how do you know? Well, because Jesus says that's the last kind of soil. There's good soil. It's the prepared heart, the cultivated heart, the ready heart. The heart where the work has been done. Verse 23, the seed that fell on good soil. The seed that fell on the soil that was prepared. The seed that falls on the soil that was ready to receive God's word. And the conditions were right for growth. 
represents those who truly hear and understand God's word. And what happens? It's not just for you. There's a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much has been planted because you're created to make a difference in the lives of other people. If you come over to my house, let me tell you a story. See what I did there? If you come over to my house, you will be astounded flabbergasted, better words, confounded, mystic, bamboozled, perplexed. You will be astonished at how bad my grass is. Like, you come up and you'll go, Pastor Jim, we need to have a talk. Like, no joke. It's embarrassingly terrible. I have fought that yard for 17 years. It's patchy. There was sod from a public works project on the front of my lawn that the sod they put in was bad sod. It was full of weeds. It was not grass. It was weeds. And you'll say, prove it to me, Jim, and you'll look up and down the street and you'll see nothing but weeds on the front half of everybody's yards. I mean, it's so bad. There was a whole section. Bruce, I, I took you out and showed you, didn't I? So I'm not lying. I took Bruce out. There's an entire section. It's 12 foot by 40 foot. One entire section of my front yard, the sod died. Like it's gone. I turned my lawnmower because I had to cut down the stupid weeds and like a whole section of sod just peels off. It never took. My yard is bad, y'all. It's so bad. I've also got a dog. So like, you know, there's like yellow spots all over too. Like I'm fighting this thing all year long. And yet you'll find patches of grass that could have been like from the master's golf course. Like you'll look at that and go, all of that and then that? How is that? In that spot, the conditions were absolutely perfect for growth and health. All of the conditions were right. Y'all, our hearts are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. The seed needs good soil for it to grow. And the only way that we can get the soil of our hearts ready for growth is we have to learn how to be people who do the work. From then on, Jesus preached two things. Repent of your sins and turn back to God. And then he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he would tell a story to draw people into a spiritual truth. Hosea talked about showers of righteousness for God's people. Jesus is talking about spiritual health and growth. How are we going to experience growth and health? The early church had it figured out. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent and turn to God. Repent and turn to God. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Does that sound like showers of righteousness to you? What was the message of Jesus? Repent and turn back to God. If you're stuck in a spiritual rut going in one direction and you can't move, repent. Because that means you're going to turn from one direction and turn to another. That's all the word repent means is turn another direction. You're headed one way, turn back. Every day is a fresh opportunity opportunity to turn towards God for life and health, for you, for your family. You can call your friends, your life group. You can call each other to it. Every day is an opportunity to do the work for growth and health. A farmer can't go out and work the soil one day in in early spring and expect the harvest to be the same after one day as a work. They go out every single day and they work. They do the work to ready the soil. Our hearts are the same way. Jesus is saying, your hearts are just like this. Repent and turn back to God. Your hearts have to be ready. Can I give you a great question to ask every single day to posture yourself for spiritual growth? Holy Spirit, will you help me grow? Like, just ask. Just ask. Put yourself in a posture 
for growth. Lord, show me what corners of my heart need tilling. Show me what dark corners of my life need some work done that you can bring life and health. Being a people of spiritual disciplines, a people of prayer, a people of worship, a people of community. Like, Lord, help me do these things so that my heart is ready to produce life in myself and in others. Produce fruit in every area of my life so that the people around me are different because they saw you reflected in my life. That's a harvest of righteousness. Do you want to get out of a spiritual rut? Are you tired of the same old, same old? Holy Spirit, show me. Help me grow. And the Holy Spirit's going to say, repent and turn back to God. Every single day, your sins are forgiven, but we get to repent and turn towards God every single day. It's the only way we're going to see personal renewal, spiritual growth, health. And can I say it for our church family? It's the only way we're going to experience revival as a people. Repent and turn back to God. Let me pray with you this morning. Lord, we live in a, a suburb, an inner ring suburb of one of the largest pair of cities in the United States. And so sometimes it's hard for us as we read uh, an agricultural story to really get our hearts lined up. But as it's fall and as we drive around out of the state, we see the leaves turning and we see combines out in the field doing the work of a harvest. Lord, this lands for us. But what lands more for us in this moment is that you took the time to explain the kind of spots our hearts can be in. That our hearts can be corrupted, distracted, or immature. And I think, Holy Spirit, what you're doing in this moment right now is you're convicting each of us. Like, none of us have this perfectly. We all have areas where we can do the work to grow and ready the soil of our hearts. Lord, we want to be a people whose hearts are ready for your word. We want to be a people. Holy Spirit, we want to be a people who you are working in and through to impact other people. Lord, we want to see those sh that shower of righteousness, those times of refreshing come, not just for our church, but the people that are all around us. We want to experience a personal renewal. Like we want to be revived in our own hearts. Our church, we want to be revived so that we have an impact on these neighbors all up and down our street. It's not about a trunk or treat or events or anything like that. It's about your spirit at work in us and through us impacting the people that are all around us. And we know we have to do the work first. So we repent. You're speaking things into us right now, Lord, areas of our lives that we need to repent and turn from. Maybe it's repenting and turning away from social media and turning back to you. Maybe it's repenting and turn, turning away from an unhealthy or toxic relationship that's polluting or distracting our hearts. We repent and we return back to you. Maybe it's first and foremost that we haven't repented of our sins, that we've never accepted you as Savior. That's step one. Lord, you went to a cross and you paid the price for our sins. Your word says that we can confess with our mouths, believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that you are Lord, you are just and right to forgive us. That even when we were still enemies, you paid the price for our sins. We repent and we turn back to you. We want to be a people of the good soil. And we pray it in your name. Amen. Church, you want to experience renewal and revival? Let's do the work.